Hello, my name is Ryan from Buster Beagle 3D, and today I'm gonna to be reviewing the 60 watt Com Marker B4 MOPA Fiber Laser Marking Machine. It's a super fast and effective tool for marking, engraving, sculpting, and even cutting of metals, plastic, stones, and leather. At 60 watts, it's my most powerful laser to date, and because of the MOPA JPT power source, it's also more versatile than a regular fiber laser. However, that power, versatility, and up to 10,000 millimeters per second of speed does come at some cost. At the time of this recording, that's about $5,200 US. So what can this laser do? And what do I think of it? Well, let's find out. I wanted to thank Commarker for providing me with this machine for my honest review. There are affiliate links in the video description that do help out the channel if you decide to purchase after hearing what I have to say about it, but that does not sway my opinion on the machine one way or the other. If you have seen my other videos, you may have seen the review I did on this laser's little brother, which was also called the Commarker B4 for some reason. But this machine, for all intents and purposes, is very different. Not only is this machine much larger physically than the other B4, it has a different laser power source. This machine again is what is called a MOPA laser. It stands for Master Oscillator Power Amplifier. Without getting into specifics of what that is or exactly how it works, unlike a regular diode or CO2 laser that mainly uses speed and power to engrave and cut, a fiber laser uses power, speed, and frequency to mark the surfaces. With a MOPA fiber laser, it adds another adjustable feature, which is the pulse duration. This gives you the flexibility to work on different materials as you are able to send high energy in potentially shorter durations, which could mean less heat and therefore better for different types of plastics and other more fragile materials that can't handle high heat engraving. It also can give you a more reliable color on stainless steel and titanium. The MOPA laser also gives you a wider range when it comes to the frequency that it can work at, which also gives you more options when marking with this type of machine. The machine itself is a single unit machine, unlike some of the other fiber lasers, where you have separate towers for the fiber source and the engraving area as another tower and plate. The B4 has a laser source at the bottom and an electric motor powered tower holding the laser head itself. You can control the raising and lowering of the laser via the two front buttons, and there is also a manual hand crank at the top. I'm guessing that the hand crank at the top is really only for minute adjustments, as it's hard to turn as it's essentially fighting against the motor of the lifting platform. Out of the back of the laser, you will see a long cord which is because this laser is also intended to be used handheld if you need to. You would simply attach the included focusing bracket and then use the machine by holding the handle on the top. It can be handheld, but not exactly what I would call portable. You do have a little bit of room to work with, but would still need to lug this heavy base around, not to mention you also need a connection to a computer to run it. To be honest, this really isn't something I plan on doing, but it's nice to know that the functionality is there if I ever need it. On the head of the laser, you have the button with the letter R for red, or how you frame your work, and M for mark, where you can tell the job to start. You don't have to use these buttons and you can still run the job straight from your software of choice, but it's nice to know that it's there. On the front of the machine, you have the power button and two buttons for the up and down movement of the laser and an emergency stop button. If you can't do anything when you first turn on the machine, make sure that emergency stop button is not pushed in. This laser comes with two different lenses that change the workable area of the machine. My machine came with the 110 millimeter lens installed, which would mean that the workable area would be around 110 millimeters by 110 millimeters. If you use the 200 millimeter lens, you would have to raise the laser head up and you would give you a larger workable area of about 200 by 200 millimeters, but the laser spot would be larger and less powerful. You can get multiple different interchangeable lenses for this machine if you like, all the way down to 70 millimeters, and then all the way up to that 200 millimeter lens. I think that anything over that would require a taller tower, and I'm not sure a Com Marker even sells a larger lens. 
Right in front of the lens are two laser pointers that, when adjusted correctly, should converge with the red laser coming out of the lens at the proper focal height for your lens. This would, of course, need to be adjusted if you switch to the 200mm lens. The company also provides a very nice metal ruler for measuring the focal length. It's nice and long, and most importantly has an end with a true zero edge, so you can trust that your measurements are correct. On the base of the workable area, you will see holes spaced out every 25 millimeters. You can use these to screw down the angle brackets that can also hold your work in place. You can also use these holes for an optional rotary tool to bolt them down. One thing that I have noticed that has changed about the work area is that the holes in the plate no longer seem to be pass-through holes. On the original B4 I had, as well as some of the earlier reviews I've seen on this particular machine, those holes had no backing but simply passed through to the electronics below. It seems now that they have changed the design and added a metal plate behind the holes to keep all the metal dust or debris from falling down into the electronics below, which is a big improvement. The machine also comes with a box that contains the driver for the rotary tools, but does not come standard with a rotary. You can choose from different designs when placing the order for this machine, but those are extra. The B4 also comes with a foot pedal that makes running batch jobs much easier and faster. The machine does come with a nice pair of safety glasses, and this time, the machine does come with a laser shield that you can prop in front of the laser itself. This is a really nice addition that didn't come with the original 20 watt B4, but I have to say, I really do like it. This MOPA fiber laser is a Galvo laser where the laser head itself does not move, but tiny mirrors in the head do. Since it's only the mirrors that move, this machine can work at a blazing 10,000 millimeters per second. That's incredibly fast. My particular machine is the 60 watt version, but this machine also comes in a 20, 30, and even 100 watt version. The laser source is a JPT M7 MOPA laser, which is a respected and reliable laser manufacturer. The B4 can deliver accuracy down to 0.01 millimeters, so it's extremely fine detail. Now again, this is a fiber laser, so it works at different wavelengths than something like a diode or even CO2 laser. It works in the 1064 nanometer wavelength, which makes it suitable for metals, plastic, stone, and leather, but not for things like paper and wood. The B4 can also be controlled through not only the provided EasyCAD software, but also through Lightburn, which is where I did a majority of my testing. If you plan on using this with Lightburn, you will have to purchase the Galvo license from Lightburn. Now, before I go into the jobs I made with this machine, I wanted to talk a little bit about my particular setup. This really is just so that you know what you're looking at while I was filming my jobs with this laser. Fiber lasers can be very powerful and they can carve into metals by ablating the surface and really just pulverizing the surface into metal dust. You really want to make sure that you have some sort of fume or dust extraction system as this is really not something you want to be breathing in. Commarker does sell an enclosure that you can get as well as a fume extractor but I don't have them so I can't speak to their effectiveness. What I built for myself however for another machine was a small enclosure that I ran all of my tests inside of. It consists of a wooden box that I made on another diode laser machine I first mounted it to the base plate so it wouldn't move. It has a hole in the top to accommodate the Galvo laser head. I made a latchable door at the front and it has a variable speed fan in the front blowing the dust and fumes to the hose attached to a powerful inline fan that removes all the particles to a filter outdoors. It's a very strong suction and was perfect for this machine. In the side here, you can see one of my cameras used for filming. This hole was also used for a rotary attachment to hold things like tumblers, but again, I just don't have one for this machine. I also have a tiny USB camera mounted onto the top of the box to be able to monitor my jobs from my computer. Inside, I have a fin plate that I used off of another laser I have, but a fin heat sink that you can purchase inexpensively online also works great for this purpose of keeping cooler air under your workpiece, as well as protecting the work surface. Again, I'm explaining all of this to you not as something that you absolutely have to do the way that I did it, but uh, I just wanted you to know 
uh, why you may see wood or these plates while I'm running my tests. I'm also going to place an SVG to the box that I made in the video description in case anyone else wants to use one as well. The first thing I wanted to explore with the machine was colors on stainless steel. Now, you can get colors on stainless steel with even less expensive diode lasers, but I've never been able to recreate them with the consistency I have with the Mopaw laser. I joined the laser masterclass as well as the ComMarker Facebook groups where I was able to find some test files for marking color on stainless. I first ran a test I found on the ComMarker group that was this color swatch that worked in EasyCAD. I did this to make sure that my machine was running as expected and it's a test from the company using the same laser. It worked out well, so then I ran this Cadillac keychain that I also found in the group to make sure it was working as expected. It turned out pretty nice, and I was very happy with the overall colors I got. Since I really wanted to work primarily in Lightburn, as it's the program that I'm most familiar with, I copied the values from that test onto my own Lightburn version using the same values. I ran those tests on a piece of stainless steel to make sure I had parity between EasyCAD and the Lightburn values. I also found some other tests on the Laser Masterclass Facebook group, so I was able to run even more tests and get more colors. As you can see, there were some really nice colors that came out. Now, some of these colors are very dependent on the angle that you are looking at them on, but some still look good from many angles. I used this knowledge of the colors to create a color engraving of this Mario head. After using the values as well as some adjustments, I was able to finally get an image that I was pretty happy with. It came out pretty nice and clear, and with the exception to the red in the hat, it also holds up for most angles. Now since Mario is copyrighted, I won't be releasing this file, but a little mouse told me that he is now fair game, so I created this totally public domain Mickey Mouse file, and using the same settings I gained from my test, I was able to make a color version of him. It turned out extremely nice, and I was very happy with the overall colors and detail. I will have a link to this Lightburn file as well in the video description. After I felt like I had the color down pretty good, I wanted to go for images on stainless steel as well. Using much of the same values as the color test, I was able to get a very detailed image of this motorcycle on the metal. I still need to play around with the values as again, I did one that was very detailed but was very angle dependent on the view and one that was less angle dependent but too dark. Overall, some really good tests that I still feel like I can tweak, but I was happy with them. After that, I moved on to my favorite thing to do with fiber lasers in general, and that is 3D engraving. It basically entails converting a 3D model into a height map that can be sliced in Lightburn, just very similar to the way that a 3D printer would be, to remove material layer by layer until you are left with a 3D form. For this, I used a brass coin blank that I purchased off of Amazon. The first one I tried was a file that I found on that Laser Masterclass Facebook group, which was super detailed. It isn't exactly the best kind of image for this type of work, but I wanted to try it anyway. I ran the file at 2100 millimeters per second at 90% power, 100 kilohertz frequency, and 200 nanosecond Q-pulse at 0 0.025 millimeter line interval for 300 passes. I followed it up with a cleanup pass at 2000 millimeters per second at 30% power, 100 kilohertz frequency, 13 nanosecond Q pulse, and 0 0.05 millimeter line interval. It took about two hours and honestly was almost too detailed. It's kind of hard to see what's going on, but upon zooming in with my camera, you can really get an idea of the crazy detail that we're seeing here. I wanted to try something a little different and less busy, so I purchased a file off of Etsy that was specifically made for this type of job, and it came out great. I used the same settings that I did before, and it really turned out amazing. Again, this is my favorite thing to do with fiber laser, and the detail that you can get is pretty impressive. This is also an area where you absolutely want to have some sort of dust removal system, as all of that material that is removed was pulverized, and you don't want that to end up in your lot. After the coins, I felt the need for the obligatory aluminum business card test. It's really something fiber lasers in general really do a good job at. The machine also comes with a material pack with some of these cards in there, 
as well as dog tags and other test products. They are almost half a millimeter thick, making them beefier than some of the others I have used in the past. I ran this dog image at 200 millimeters per second at 25% power, 60 kilohertz frequency, and 200 nanosecond pulse. The image was processed in light burn using the Stucky dithering method at 0.05 millimeter line interval. Again, the machine performed perfectly and the image came out and looks even greater in person. After that, I wanted to try an image again, but this time, since the machine is so powerful, I wanted to see how cutting the design out of the card would actually work. I ran this image of this eagle that I again purchased off of Etsy and the same settings as before, but this time I ran a cut operation after the engraving. I cut it at 2,500 millimeters per second at 100% power, 60 kilohertz frequency, and 200 nanosecond Q-pulse. I ran this for 1,500 passes. The top number that you can use in light burn is 500 passes, so I ran that particular job three times. It's really this fast. I'm not speeding this footage. I was trying to get the best camera shot possible to show you guys, and apparently I got too close, so my camera got in the way between the laser and the card. The camera took it like a champ and kept running, but it also gave me an idea for this card. I really like the idea of not fully removing the part from the card, so I could use the leftover parts as almost a stand for the art, so next time I intentionally left a tab so I could bend the part out without fully removing it. It really worked out great and I was happy with the results. I also did another version where I completely removed the cut and it turned out nice as well. The last test that I ran on this machine so far was to do a few tests on plastic. Now, I would need to run more tests on a variety of different materials till I get a good catalog of settings, but so far the results are promising. Here you can see two tests run on these two travel power bricks. Both of these were run at the same settings, and you can see that one turned out white while the other one turned out dark. So the type of plastic will make a huge difference in how these markings behave. Overall, I was very happy with how this machine functioned. I'm not gonna lie and tell you that all of this is easy, and I do feel like fiber lasers, and even more so with MOPA functionality, do have a slightly higher learning curve over your standard diode or even CO2 laser. However, if metal marking, engraving, or cutting is what you want to do, you really can be one of these types of lasers. I have mentioned this in the past, but there is also a great resource on learning how to use this type of machine over on the Laser Everything YouTube channel. Over there, you will find extensive tutorials and explanations of how much of this works, as well as power and speed libraries that can really give you a great starting point with a machine like this. Now again, this is not a cheap machine, but you don't have to get the 60 watt if you don't need that much power. I have made those 3D coins with a 30 watt laser, which may have taken a little bit longer, but it still gets the job done. If you get a fiber laser without the MOPA capabilities because the consistent colors on stainless steel isn't important to you, or the wide range of shades on different plastics is not what you're after, you can get a regular fiber laser and potentially save thousands. You could get a 60 watt COM marker B4 non-MOPA fiber laser for around $1,400 less right now. So it's really up to you to get what suits your needs. If all of that stuff is important to you and you are in the market specifically for a MOPA laser, then this 60 watt B4 MOPA from Commarker is a good choice. It's a solid build machine that I know I'm going to get a lot of good use out of. I wanted to once again thank Commarker for providing me with this machine for my honest review of it. Again, there are affiliate links in the description that do help out the channel a little bit if you choose to use them, but it's never required. Thanks again for watching, and if you like this content, please do hit that like button and consider subscribing for more videos having to do with laser engravers, 3D printing, injection molding, and all things maker. Thanks again, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.